way I'm going to run, we're going to run the presentation is I've got a few slides I'm going to hand over on this very basic overview, technology, concept, etc. I'm then going to hand over to Falco, who's going to, who, who's got a presentation. I'm going to go into a bit more detail. It's a bit more up to date. There's a short video in there, only a minute or two. And then if there's time, I can come back to talk about some of the UK specifics. Uh, specific advantages of the UK, because as many of you may know, this is uh, essentially a project for countries with a lot more, or the concentrated solar power as a technology that uh, uh, comes into being a lot further south in the UK. So, uh, concentrated solar power is the technology. Um, it's also known as solar thermal, different from photovoltaics, which is the flat panel PV. So it's uh, a different uh, form of solar technology than photovoltaics entirely. Uh, there's different configurations in technological terms of effectively the same, same method. Uh, you're basically concentrating the sun's energy onto a focal point. Uh, that can either be at the top of a tower uh, the two top pictures, they're both uh, solar power towers and they are in, um, both in uh, Andalusia in Spain near Seville. So they're the same uh, shot just taken from slightly different angles. Um, the sun's energy, as you can see, is concentrated at the top of the tower which reaches several hundred degrees. Are they actually white or do they just look white? Which bit? The tower. The tower is as you see it. Uh, it's lit up by the sun. To a certain degree, but that's that's a that's a picture we took not long ago, after it, shortly after it was built. So there's in fact two, uh, I think one 10 and one 20 megawatt plant next to each other uh, at, at this site, which is the um, uh, I forget the name of this one. Yeah. But it uh, looks white uh, just on the picture. The temperature on the tower, solar towers, is up to 1,000, 1,100 degrees. And it probably changes the color of the picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the second um, way of structuring your collectors is to have a, uh, a parabolic trough, uh, which focuses the sun's energy at the apex of this, which is, is running along the center of these troughs here. Uh, this, this is a, a tube, which you'd have a, a heat transfer fluid in, which would typically be a, a synthetic oil that transfers the heat from the solar array to the uh, power drop. Uh, this, uh, this is called linear Fresnel. It's another uh, format, and you collect the sun energy in the tube running over the top. Dwell on these. This is just to give you an idea of the type, the, the sort of what the technology looks like. These are um, Stirling dish engines, again focusing here in the middle, uh, and these. This is a close-up of the um, mirrors that direct the energy towards the top of the towers. Uh, they track the sun throughout the day, so they, they, they move on two axes, as opposed to the. Uh, troughs which only rotate on one axis and also in an effort to track the sun from east to west throughout the day. Uh, this is an important aspect of <coughs> concentrated solar power, so, solar thermal, that I think Falco will concentrate on a bit more. It's um, the concept of storing um, the sun's energy as heat. You, uh, you melt salt. So these are tanks full of molten salt uh, that you can store the sun's energy in and then therefore uh, have it as dispatchable. Uh, you generate electricity as and when required. So when the sun goes down at night, you can continue generating uh, throughout the 24-hour period. Um, this is a schematic, uh, sort of technical schematic of, of the scheme. Perhaps no need to dwell on this, but it's it's suffice to say uh, you've got your solar array, and thereafter the system is effectively the same as a conventional power plant. Instead of using fossil fuels to generate heat to then raise steam and generate electricity, we're using the heat of the sun. But from, for the main part of it, it's uh, a conventional uh, turbine connection to the grid, sort of large utility scale uh, way of generating electricity. With the usual condensers, cooling towers, etc., depending on the type of technology. Uh, a one quick slide on the concept, just uh, an overview of the 
geographical region of, of this, uh, the, this was the, the European Middle East and North Africa was the, sort of the first area that was looked at uh, with regards to what's called the Desert Tech concept. Um, again, Falco is going to go into this in, in, in much more detail. Important to say, it's not just about concentrated solar power technology in North Africa. Uh, the wider picture is a super grid that spans North Africa uh, and the rest of Europe and uh, into which various other renewable technologies uh, will feed. In the press, when you see Desertec and the name Desertec, uh, that is often uh, read just to mean collecting uh, energy from the desert, but of course the overall aim of the Desertec concept is to bring in 15% of European electrical demand by 2050, 1.5 and to meet a substantial amount of the uh, host country demand as well, yet to be defined, as, as far as I'm aware. Um, there's some boxes here, with red boxes, which some of you may be familiar with. They're there to give you an idea of the sort of land area that, you, that would be required in order to meet the electrical demand of, uh, well, the biggest one is the entire world. So I think that's uh, 900 by 900 kilometers squared, which meets is the equivalent to the electric demand of the world. So that's, but it always looks bigger to me. This square is apparently 1% of the area of the, the Sahara Desert as a whole. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't read things very clearly. The uh, network of bits all joined up in North Africa and in Arabia and so forth, are those existing plants? Are they planned nope. plants? Or this is, this is a very high-level... Gen uh, generic schematic at, at the moment. Components of this are going in uh, slower than some people would like. All of those places? No, no, these are entirely uh, there for um, diagrammatical purposes. There's no single plant that's located exactly on any of those spots. This is just a general idea of uh, what a super grid might look like. Okay. Some, there are plants being built, concentrated solar power plants being built in southern Spain and North Africa, but this does not <coughs> reflect the exact location of any one particular plant. Uh, those squares that you've got are those for the equivalent of electricity demand or the equivalent of total energy demand? That's just electrical demand. Okay, so they want the total world energy to be a lot bigger then? Absolutely. Well, it depends. Yeah, somehow that study already includes uh, electricity used in cars because we can just make an assumption right now how much in the future electricity will be used in cars or if we will see other sources of energy still used to make your car run. Uh, and also, um, you try, it's, a, it's a looking at the whole economy as a whole. So the question would be how much we change from an oil-based economy to a more electricity-based economy. So you have a lot of assumption within that but picture. That as well. world demand. Um, it is electricity, but assuming that uh, the whole consumption of energy will be more focused on a more ele uh, no, right. electricity-based system. On exactly that point, if I, if I could. Um, so in other words, those are desertecs, as you say, assumption-driven projections of what e electricity demand is likely to be. Is there any sense in which you are relating that, kind of correlating it back to independent assumptions for the moment, i.e. a United Nations, anything else like that? I will uh, briefly uh, talk about it then I... Uh, okay. So yeah, we'll come back to that, or well, Falco will. So this is uh, just an idea of where the sun shines in terms of uh, direct normal irradiation, which is what you want for uh, concentrated solar power technology. You want clear skies, direct sunlight, uh, different to photovoltaics, which uses <coughs> diffuse light. So in Germany, you can have uh, a reasonable yield with photovoltaics, whereas for concentrated solar power, you really need to move to the deserts where there's uh, there's no clouds. Um, this is worth saying that 90% of the world's population lives within striking distance of uh, the world, uh, a desert. So you've got the, the tar desert in India, uh, obviously the Sahara, there's various deserts in the southwest USA, Chile, South Africa, there's deserts around it. With a sort of super grid network, you're within strike, 90% of the world's population is within striking distance. So this isn't just an idea for 
Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa. It's a blueprint that, in theory, can work uh, throughout the world. Uh, this is a, one, I won't go into cost in any, any great detail, this is just an interesting slide, uh, I think, showing that with uh, an added cost, <coughs> subsidies, increased electricity bills of 75 billion US dollars, a prediction that uh, the TREP network came up with when they, the DLR, when they produced the reports, was that uh, you'd have cost parity with uh, fossil fuels by sort of the near the end of this decade with a, a subsidy of uh, just 75 billion US. Now I don't know the details behind this but uh, that would, if you consider that the world is populated uh, by how many people it's going to be, let's say 9 billion in 2050, you could easily, you would argue 1 billion of them live in the current developed world and largely responsible for the CO2 in the atmosphere today so one billion people, $75 billion, that's uh, $75 per head to get, get you a technology that is uh, uh, at cost parity with uh, existing hydrocarbons. And that's, it's got some fairly uh, conservative assumptions in there, such as oil, uh, a cost of oil at $25 a barrel. Of course, it's... $10 a barrel It's well over 100 at the moment. It has been... Uh, and it's falling a bit again. It's falling a bit, right, okay. So there's, I don't know what, how conservative the assumption is for coal, which perhaps is more relevant, but uh, there are, uh, and this is assuming a cost increase of 1% per year, which is looking pretty optimistic at the moment. Retail or whole, uh, two questions, retail or whole, or whole sale prices, and secondly, are you talking about grid parity? Uh, first question, I don't know the answer to it, Falco might come back important. to that. Uh, uh, I will talk about the price levels later. Right. It's more yeah. about calculation and how do we actually calculate that stuff? Um, yeah. The it's question is how do you cal calculate it? Is what it represents? Um, well, if you think about how much electric. In Germany, we mostly compare it to nuclear power. We try to abandon it, yeah. but still, that's in so our heads. We have to uh, go for the cheapest <coughs> source of energy. And the question with uh, solar power, especially solar, solar thermal, is almost 100% of your investment at the beginning. And the power plant is made largely out of glass and steel, and it probably lasts a long time. Uh, time horizon for amortization usually is 10 to 15 years. If you calculate for that amount of time, you come up to prices around 5 cents or wholesale or prices. If you calculate it for 100, you're already far cheaper than nuclear power. So it's a bit of a calculation game. Great respect, I mean, that, that's fascinating. It's not a question I asked. I'm trying to put and establish what those costs um, represent. Are those, are those retail costs of, of, of electricity, or are they wholesale costs of electricity? Or that's what I'm trying to be, be, uh, get All the established. comparison we did is on wholesale, comparing how much is electricity from uh, solar thermal compared to wholesale price of uh, nuclear. Uh, even we so not talk about wholesale, we even take it one step lower, but in a sense, production costs. Uh, up to a certain feed-in point, uh, because we also have uh, the cost for the grid uh, calculated into that cost. And if you think uh, about the plan as well, half the cost goes for the grid. Uh, building a grid is very expensive. So this is whole. So this is production. Production also, plus without, without distribution, uh, including distribution. If you think about the net. Okay. And where are you comparing it to oil and coal? Are you comparing it to the price of electricity generated from coal? Or are you comparing it for the use of coal? Because I know uh, it's, mix, a it's a mix. It's a mixture. Okay. Uh, the study is unfortunately seven years, eight years old, and as you can see from the oil price, things have changed. Yeah. Um, you, if you think about oil price, which is the price per uh, I don't know, barrel at the moment, it's already far higher, and um, well, it depends on. If you think about extracting it very cheap and dirty from tar sand, of course you can have a lower price. Uh, not all price uh, parts always include a nuclear power, doesn't include insurance for a nuclear power plant, doesn't include what you do with the waste. Same thing with oil. Uh, we try to include most components, but you will never have a 100% correct picture. It's just an assumption.
so that we can keep on track time-wise, can we perhaps take notes of questions and anything we'd like to raise and allow the speakers to finish their presentations and then we can have a discussion about um, yes. those points. Okay. We'll, try and, we'll try and whiz through as fast as we can and, and leave plenty of time for questions. So. Uh, this is just a slide on sort of the history of the project, I suppose. It started as uh, what you might call a research project at the DLR, which is uh, the German Aerospace Centre. Uh, three fairly heavyweight reports, out of which a lot of these figures, uh, this is where they're <coughs> just done on the back of an envelope. You know, there's, some, there's some fair bit of number crunching has gone into the generation of these reports on the, uh, the concept itself, on the transmission, and on uh, one of the spin-off benefits, which is um, desalination. Uh, you can use the waste heat in certain circumstances to desalinate water, obviously very uh, popular and topical in the Middle East and North Africa. I think Falco will come back to that. Um, so this is Dr. Kerhard Kanis, the grandfather or father of the concept in, in many people's opinion. Um, he formed the TREK network of uh, scientists and engineers, a voluntary network of scientists and engineers, uh, along with the Club of Rome and Prince Hassan to uh, advocate this uh, uh, research concept. Uh, Desert Tech UK, how do we fit into that? Well, we um, supported the work that was going on in, in Germany. We, uh, Dr. Jerry Wolf, you can see here, is the coordinator of Desert Tech UK, picked up on this idea, and has been advocating it here in the UK for uh, seven or eight years, I think, now. Uh, he's had various successes along the way, including uh, an early donation in the House of Commons and a debate uh, also in, in Parliament, and a number of um, uh, events such as this, which we uh, attend. Um, so in, it would have been 2009, I suppose, uh, the big business bit, big business <coughs> latched onto this idea, realised, uh, well, you can see the list of blue chip companies down the bottom got together, realising something needs to happen in, in this direction. And uh, it was led mainly by Munich Ray. They got together with the Desdeck Foundation, looked at the research, and decided to uh, conduct some feasibility studies. Uh, they formed what's called the Desdeck Industrial Initiative, of which the Desdeck Foundation is, the, is, is one of the shareholders, one of the founding members, if you like. Uh, the rest are big industrial companies, mostly German, some uh, Spanish, I think one North African in there as well. Uh, their idea is to develop uh, the Saharan part of this equation at the cost of estimates range up to sort of 400 billion euros, and that's to be spent between now and 2050. Um, there's another organization called Medgrid, uh, again, it's a consortium of similar sized companies, um, looking more at grid issues. Uh, although the Desertec Industrial Initiative is looking at all uh, technology uh, reference projects, uh, the socio-economics, environmental issues, they've got a quite a wide uh, scope at the moment. They've been around for three years, they're just about to issue, I think it's their first main report this week uh, on their work done to date, so there'll be a lot of attention in the press, I would have thought about uh, what that report says. Um, there's a staff of 40 or so in, or maybe 25 I think initially, I don't know what it's at now, that's in Munich, and they've been working away to sort of pave the way for all of the big industrial companies you see listed at the bottom there, or they're all uh, banks, insurance companies, or uh, utilities, uh, so they need, before going ahead with this, they need some reassurance, and this is the purpose of the 25 staff working in Munich, to pave the way. I guess at some point they'll form various consortia within them, go ahead and uh, develop this as, a, as industrial projects. So there's reference projects happening in uh, Morocco and Tunisia is Turner, that's a two gigawatt project. Uh, I think the total of the Moroccan projects is on quite a large scale. You can build it, it's modular, yeah. so you can increase it. Yeah, so I think another couple of gigawatts going ahead in, in Morocco. Um, I won't dwell on that, all that. I think this is probably a good point to hand over to. Found those. He's, he's got his, we need to know that we're both going to be here doing this um, together, so apologies for the splicing in, but I think 
Well, thank you very much for coming and listening to what I have to say. <laughs> and I, hope as well as you can. I will try, and if um, I already want to apologize for my English, I'm not a native English speaker, and uh, if it's not loud enough, please tell me. Probably the voice will <laughs> go down after a while. Um, yes. Yes, wunderbar is good. Danke. <laughs> so, um, what will I briefly talk about? Why Desert Tech? Um, what actually led to that concept? Uh, then explain the concept within the focus region, Eumena, uh, which is uh, Europe, uh, Middle East, North, uh, Northern Africa, what we already looked at. Uh, then show some technical implications, including a video, some of it we have already seen. Uh, a little bit of talk about that and uh, my focus will also be on a socio-economic uh, perspective uh, which we as a Desert Tech Foundation put a large um, emphasis on and at the end uh, if I have time I'll talk about the foundation itself, what we are, who we are, where we sit. Uh, so why Desert Tech concept? Uh, the main focus and that actually leads back to that question uh, you had earlier, what numbers do we put into our calculation. Uh, this is based on uh, calculations from the UN, looking at uh, population growth, um, thinking about the Earth as a habitat uh, with a certain amount of resources being available uh, to us, and how we consume them and how we actually change our environment. Um, it's called the carrying capacity. And if you think about a small little island, Amount, certain amount of food being available, how much birds can actually live. Uh, it's actually from Humboldt uh, looking how many birds can live on that little island sustainably uh, without any input from the outside, like we are on Earth. And it says uh, that we roughly about five to six billion people can sustainably live <coughs> on Earth. And as you may already know, we already have around seven billion questioning the sustainability of Earth as we have it right now. And on top of it, if you think about pollution, climate change, that will further reduce uh, the Earth's carrying <laughs> capacity, leading to the point where we actually need like three little rocks going around uh, the sun to be enough space for everybody. And on top of it, uh, calculations say population growth to 2050 is 9 to 10 billion. Nobody knows if it will decline at one point because there's not enough, not enough food available. Maybe more natural catastrophes will happen as we don't hope, but um, you never know. Uh, so you have a difference between how many we can actually, people can live sustainably on Earth and how much uh, we will actually destroy Earth already to make that possible. Uh, another aspect is um, mainly press actually focus on uh, carbon dioxide or carbon dioxide uh, as an important factor uh, affecting life on Earth. There are other things uh, which have a big, bigger uh, effect, like methane, actually. But that's what the press focus on. That's what science, unfortunately, focus on, too. Uh, it's the budget available to us, uh, what we can use up before we will hit certain trigger points, before uh, climate change will increase beyond the point where we cannot calculate it anymore. Unfortunately, that numbers are guessing work as well. You don't know where the trigger points are. You don't know how much budget is available to us, uh, but many scientists uh, put a lot of effort into come up with, num with these numbers. It can be debated, so I will not um, focus on any small percentages on details, but just to give you a figure, we have only a certain amount of time available to us to change something. So from that, all the scientists in the track network or Desert Tech Foundation said, okay, we have to do something, and for us, the trigger point was actually the catastrophe in Chernobyl. Many of our scientists come from various fields. Some of them worked within nuclear science and said, okay, actually it cannot go that direction anymore. We totally ignored the bad effects that can happen. And uh, sitting down, discussing with other colleagues what we can do, we found out that so sun is receiving so much energy coming from the sun, which is available to us. I always say almost for free, but of course you have developing costs and something like that. Uh, but we don't use it. 
And uh, especially uh, looking at the figures, the Earth receives within six hours the equivalent to energy, uh, the energy we consume within one year, which is a large, impressive number. Of course, it's a nice statement, uh, but it's true. And already, uh, how I talked about the fact that 90% of the population live within 3,000 kilometers of suitable deserts. Uh, not all the deserts you probably think of uh, are suitable, especially the ones I have in my head with the nice sand dunes. And when I think about holiday, uh, holidays, that's not the ones uh, which are suitable. You need a uh, flat surface, uh, some kind of rocks is fine, usually a plateau, uh, which is actually the majority of the deserts. The sand dunes are a rather small, rather small part, funny enough. Um, what you see here, the I'm colorblind, so I never know if that's green or yellow, but uh, that is um, the centers of consumption. That's where people live. And uh, in contrast, you saw uh, the red parts, that's where the sun uh, is. And um, only fractions of the desert is actually needed. Uh, today, we have that little square, and in 2050, we assume that square. Based on a lot of assumptions, uh, calculating some uh, more uh, per capita consumption, thinking, okay, population will grow, that's one thing, but the consumption of electricity per person, especially if you think about India, Africa, and China, will also increase. Is that, is that mirror area or the plant tunnel area? Uh, mirror area, actually. Okay. But the plant. The plant uh, well, mirror plus the space around the mirror. All right. Okay, but uh, doesn't include the space for uh, solar, uh, the salt, um, the salt uh, storage. Right. I mean, it's always a calculation. Uh, we, one of the things is also technical. Uh, when I would go to the technical stuff, we think that there's a lot of room for technical improvement within solar thermal compared to PV, for example. Um, now I would like to focus, as my colleague already did, on the Oimena region. Uh, which is one part of it. Australia is also a very interesting area, as is South, Southern Africa and China as well. But the biggest uh, thing compared to what you can probably read about Desert Tech uh, in the press and what we actually do is we not only focus on solar power, we focus on all uh, renewable energies, including biomass, geothermal, wind power, and hydropower. But you have to put that uh, into mind also that biomass can be debated. Uh, there's problems about thinking about what do we mean with biotest. We are not a big fan of biofuel uh, because it destroys the carrying capacity of Earth. Uh, you destroy the rainforest, which has a huge impact on our whole ecosystems. Uh, thinking about putting something into a tank, which could be anybody's, somebody else's food, is another thing you should. Uh, Think about, but there's other biomassing uh, stuff. Uh, if you have to think about bio waste, and if you use that, we think there's an opportunity in that. Beside the fact that you have to be careful with what happens in the bioreactor with the Escher coli, and if they might escape, and they have maybe mutated to something that's bad. Uh, geothermal <coughs> within the regions where it's suitable is another interesting uh, idea where we focus on especially, for example, in Germany, Northern uh, Europe, but it depends on the scale. If you have a very large scale project, you have to have a lot of things you have to think about. has been one case in Austria, I think, where you build a huge uh, power plant. Unfortunately, the earth under it, uh, a small bubble uh, collapsed, and the whole city above uh, sunk a little bit down, causing a lot of damage. Wind power, which is a great source of uh, renewable energy for the UK, for example. Uh, and also Northern Africa, especially Morocco, has very good sites, as well as Egypt. And in combination with solar power, it's a perfect match. Hydropower, also thinking about storing uh, energy, plays a big role in the concept as well. But if you compare these figures, uh, I put on top of the little pictures compared to the European demand and then look at the figures for solar power. Uh, the source, solar power has far greater potential. You cannot ha harvest all the energy possibly available, but to th thinking about 1% of it would already be enough. Sorry, Ken, those are desert tech predictions. Of course. 
Uh, there are other signs. Uh, well, the predictions based on that are not coming originally from Desertec. They're coming from the German Aerospace Center. They developed that study, which largely feeds into the Desertec concept. Uh, why is that? Uh, despite the NASA, the US, NASA, uh, Germany decided in the 70s to shoot up a satellite into space and collect uh, solar radiation data, um, which is like the main source available to us and which actually gives the academic background to the project. Without that satellite, all the calculations wouldn't have been possible, especially because the NASA data and I say that in the States, you don't hear that, don't like to hear that. The NASA data is not that good as they always tell us it is. Uh, but back to the slide, as you already saw, it's a rough uh, demonstration how the network uh, could be, which is even more important than the power plants, if you ask me. Another uh, why is that? Because you have to have power plants for the peak of consumption. And if you think about the consumption of electricity over a day, you usually have like a high peak and you have to build a power plant for that peak. So if you can make it possible to level out the different consumption between countries, my example is always Egypt. Biggest co uh, power consumption is around nine o'clock in the evening when they turn on the TV and all uh, the appliances compared to Saudi Arabia where they have to peak at the middle of the day, turning on all the air conditionings. So there's a power cable being built, or two actually, at the moment, just <coughs> connecting these two countries. There's no, no power plant involved, just the cable, and by evening out or leveling out um, the peaks, you can save up to t 10 power plants. Uh, so the grid is really important. And why is that also? Because you want to produce the energy at the places where it is produced best. In Germany, we like to have the solar panels on our rooftop and we try to feel independent and it's also a little bit a way of being democratizing energy production because you can have your own little power plant, uh, but for the larger impl uh, implication, thinking about energy for, let's see, let's say an aluminium plant, which consumes as much energy as a power plant built right next to it, you have to think about a larger scale. And therefore, you need the grid. For a small PV panel, you can be off-grid, which is great for Sub-Saharan Africa, for example. A uh, problem with energy transportation is you lose by transporting it. Um, what does the Desert Tech came? Uh, the Desert Tech came up with a possible solution to that, uh, which is actually a very old solution. If you think about uh, Thomas Edison and uh, DC power or direct current versus <coughs> alternative current. We are just focusing back on a very old technology. First uh, technical <coughs> solutions have been built in 1945 and at the moment China is showing us uh, the big scale projects co uh, connecting their dams uh, with the centers of consumption and uh, it's a very efficient way uh, with only 3%, well, reality is more like 5 to 5% 5 uh, of transmission losses right now, but we think it can be even lower in the future. And on top of it, there's another thing compared to normal power lines. The, you need less space. And one of the big problems <coughs> for Desert Tech and its implementation is actually not the technical background, it's the political, and it's the question, do I really want to have a new cable in my backyard? Uh, if I, I have one example later about connecting Northern Africa and Europe and it's more difficult to build a cable through Sicilia and southern Italy than to build it in the, uh, using a large sea cable because it would take you years and years to convince local governments, the people to buy the land and to build a cable. So using that technology saves us a lot of trouble. On the technical point of view, may I interrupt you? Um, Not really. No. I think I want to get lost. Yeah, if we could just continue with the presentation and cool. maybe okay. make, make a note of your point. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. I will try to answer. Uh, we saw already different uh, possible ways. Uh, talked about solar uh, tower, which I think at the moment the power plants focus on a parabolic trough. At the moment, uh, it's technical, very difficult. 
It lo looks simple, but it's difficult because the mirror, the newest mirror is up to 13 meters, and you have to make sure uh, it's bent the right way, and one millimeter already makes a big difference, which is always uh, surprising me, but you the, um, well, maybe it's a German thing to get the highest percentage out of the technology. Um, I personally say go for the solar tower. Uh, it's just plain um, glass and just a plain mirror, far easier to manufacture. Can also be manufactured uh, on the side, not direct in the desert, but within the cent uh, within the uh, pr yeah within the country uh, of. Um, bringing jobs to region, which is very important for us as a foundation. Uh, similar concept is the Linar Fresnel, is just trying to make a bent mirror into a smaller, uh, just plain mirrors. And the parabolic dish is like a special installation. You use it mostly off-site, off-grid. Um, another point of the solar tower is I can go up to very high temperatures, which I don't use in a parabolic trough. Uh, because to use high temperature, I need very high quality steel, and that makes the whole thing very expensive. If I only need it in that little tower, as you saw in the picture, uh, I can use that high, uh, very quali high quality of steel. Uh, temperatures are up to 1,000, 1,200 says there, 1,100, I would say. Um, compared to 450, 500 degrees, and according to the second thermal law, it's bigger the delta, uh, it's far more uh, your result. Is. This is how it looks in real life, as we already saw. Um, what's the difference between, why do we go for the solar thermal and why don't we go for PV, especially because the PV panels or uh, solar panel, the prices drop dramatically. Uh, the difference is actually how to store electricity. It's still a big problem to store electricity. You can use a very large scale battery, uh, but the loss would be far greater comparing to store energy in form of heat. So that's why we focus on solar thermal, because you also need energy at night. And the sun, unfortunately, doesn't shine at night. So we try to uh, close that gap by having a storage system. And at the moment, um, well, you have five hours to eight hours of storage making the energy available at night as well. Uh, making that technology actually be, for the first time, able to use renewable energy constantly. So you can have it 24 hours, and in our concept, we try to con uh, connect that with wind power, uh, both together. Uh, yeah, it's like a good marriage, I can say. Uh, question is, is the technology feasible? Does it last? You know, the deserts are uh, kind of a hostile place, actually. Very high temperature during the day, very low temperatures during the night, sandstorms, hail, and other things. But uh, there is a, a test installation of the first uh, power plant, actually, in Mojave Desert in the States. It's already 25, 30 years old, and it showed to us that it is feasible, it is doable, and actually it worked better than originally anticipated. Um, mostly due to new technologies. The weather forecasts become better. better. You can make a weather forecast for a specific place in the desert these days. And the mirrors have a parking position, so if you know there's a sandstorm coming, you move them into a parking position, protect, protecting them from harm. Um, of course, some mirrors will still be damaged, uh, and you have to clean them up, which will I show now. Usually I should be medium. Okay. Um, there's no sound to it, so I will speak if I'm allowed to. Uh, that shows the power plant in Almeria, Spain, uh, one of the bigger installations. Uh, the problem with these power plants you see here, we still clean the mirrors with water. And unfortunately, in a the desert, there is not always water available. And if there's available, that's usually historic water, and we don't want to tap into that because once you use that up, it will never come back. Uh, but uh, new uh, mirrors are uh, coded, or not coded with nanoscience, but they have a special pattern, like very small glass dots onto it, and it makes the dust um, not glued to it or not stick to it that much. And uh, so we, this, the mirrors, if you have an area where you have some wind blowing, will clean themselves. Of course, they will not be 100% clean, 
but 95% are enough, we think. <laughs> Maybe even 80 would be enough. And as you saw here, um, this, this, uh, the oil I explained earlier will heat up water, which then will run a normal steam engine. And this is the storage system, so at night you pump the hot uh, salt back and you can uh, generate electricity from that at night time. Lovely graphic. Can you go to the next slide? Um, I said earlier, why also focusing on solar thermal? Because we think there's far more technical development still possible within that area. Um, if you look at photovoltaics, even if I read new uh, reports from scientists, that they're even able to increase that, reach like a technical limit. There's not <coughs> much more uh, of in, uh, improvement possible. Um, some scientists even, I always say, bend the laws and saying uh, now we have a solar cell that can use 120% of the solar energy. Uh, and it's possible in a sense because they use also the heat uh, that is, uh, but well, if the sun uh, comes on the solar uh, cell, it also again generates a certain amount of heat. And now they found a way to even use some parts of that heat. So we may see some uh, installation which uses 120, 130, making a cell very expensive. But there is also room for improvement there. But compared to uh, solar thermal, uh, we think the improvements are very, uh, the possible improvements are far bigger. Uh, why is that? Uh, at the moment we use a synthetic oil, uh, there are research going on to use so-called supercritical cone dioxide. Supercritical means it al it's almost acts like a liquid, but it's still a gas. Uh, on top of it, cone dioxide doesn't interact with the steel, so I don't have the problem that the steel corrode over time. Uh, I can save the converter because I can directly put that supercritical cone dioxide onto the steam engine, but that's far science. Give it 30 more years, yeah. But that's what the scientists talk about right now. Uh, and on top of it, uh, the molten salt can still be uh, uh, increased. Every new power plant has a different mix of salt in it, so we are still experimenting around. Yeah, and there's other things um, which I just but well, we don't have the time, so I can talk for hours on that one because that's my main interest. Um, but now let me uh, take you to the social economics. <coughs> uh, could you keep it brief within a couple of minutes? Is that possible? I try to. Okay, okay. I will say I will minutes. just no. give you some brief words. Uh, we expect the consumption to go up in the MENA region up to six times more people more consumption, Europe slow down, unfortunately to, due to the fact that some of our industry ships overseas. Uh, and in the large future, we focusing more on supplying, uh, bringing energy to Northern Africa than we focus on bringing energy to Europe at the moment. But by 2050, we want to give these countries a new export good. Oil will run out at one point, nobody knows when. But let's say it runs out in 2050s to make these countries stable and do not have a new war, a new Arab Spring. We have to give them something to export. And that could be solar energy, which is great for them and great for us because less carbon and um, cleaner power. Uh, that's a possible installation, which is a project that right now is a UK company uh, in a joint venture with Tunisian companies, as my colleague already talked about. And there's the cable I talked about. We actually go and build a cable between Tunisia and northern Rome uh, and not going through Sicilia because it's far easier than talking to people, unfortunately. Or politicians, let me put it this way. And for us, it's important to uh, create jobs within the region, stabilizing the region. Many of our uh, people working within Desertex come from Morocco, come from Tunisia, come for e from Egypt. They are very well educated. The universities in these countries are great. Unfortunately, if you come from the university, you don't find a job. And what does it do to you? Well, if I would live there, I, I would have a great uh, education. I would probably be very unhappy, either try to start a revolution or go to Europe. And so it's about stabilizing the region. 
just to sum that up, uh, the Desert Tech idea is about climate protection, carbon reduction, higher energy security, which is a German topic because we want to not be that much dependent on Russian oil and gas, especially when they decide again to turn off the gas. And for the uh, Northern Africa region, drinking water is a big problem. If you think about Egypt, already a population which I think it's 70 million uh, per capita, uh, the water available to them is already low and almost below UN standards and probably po population will increase by two. So well, do they share that water? That's already not enough. Um, so that's a big problem. Um, bring it's developing future industries, but developing jobs within the region. We know there's not many people actually being necessary to run the power plant. Uh, but in a country where, for example, in Morocco, a king almost controls the whole economy in one way or the other, uh, you can have three people working one job, sharing a job. Uh, it's nothing we think about in Europe. It's solutions for a country where things are different. So sometimes thinking about democratizing the union, we have to think differently. And our, Europe, uh, our international partners help us a lot about that way of starting to think different. And on top of it, international peacekeeping. Uh, as I said, this discussed with my colleague earlier, uh, oil can always put into a big super tanker and ship it from Africa to China, and they're happy to buy it. Uh, but once you build a power cable, that country is actually dependent on a symbiotic, a symbiotic uh, connection between uh, the production country and the center of consumption. Uh, so both countries, as a Euro European country or the Northern African country, really have to work together because the ca cable, in a sense, is binding them together. And that's why the explanation mark is there. Um, yes, so in a sense, we bring all renewable energies together using a super, um, super national grid, which brings our main problem actually on the table. Talking, for example, with France, they want to sell their nuclear power, so they're not really open to let other power through their network. That's what we focus on mostly. Technology is available. Forgot to mention that the first solar thermal power plant was built in 1960. Unfortunately, somebody found oil, and it made far more sense for the military machinery to use that oil to run their tanks than to put sun into a tank. And last one, I will go to that question quickly. Uh, last one is, yeah, win win strategy. I don't like that word, but it's good for all people involved, we say. You may think different. And beside that region, uh, we also have other regions we focus on. China, for example, they came up with a new 10-year plan, and we had the translator translating that piece of paper five times because the number they have in there for building solar power plants was so great that we think uh, we are a very small project. And um, yes, as a foundation, we are 30 staff members, uh, mostly studied in Germany, but around the globe. Uh, founded by Club of Rome, uh, based on the German aerospace uh, figures, in a sense. Our missions are, well, you see me running through it. Uh, our focus is, on, we founded the DII initiative, which is the industrial end, where all the big companies are in Siemens, ABB. Uh, on top of it, we have a university network because our work is bringing scientists together, shaping the ideas, and on top of it, we are now active in social networks and all these new stuff. And you also have a Desert Tech knowledge platform, platform which we're really happy about. It's like a Wikipedia for Desert Tech, uh, where scientists, students, and everybody else can share their ideas. Uh, and it's also for the countries and all the people we work in these countries by saying, okay, there's a site, it's good, I know somebody, it's bringing people together. Uh, that's the partners of the foundation, uh, like Greenpeace, for example. And, okay, uh, I'm going to have to ask that we open the floor to questions and now, because I think quite a few people are eager, eager to, to ask you some things. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm going to have three people propose their points and then we'll have the speakers answer because we're a bit short of time. So the gentleman in the centre and yourself and Andrew. Well, it's 100% convincing uh, that I heard about this a few years ago. Um, I'm, not, I'm not hearing of any desert tech electricity coming to 
northern Europe or to Britain. In the meantime, climate change is advancing. There's a danger of more coal-fired power stations being built. Um, the fracking, you know, that seems to just appear like that, like that in the last couple of years. Uh, the, the same with the uh, coal tar, whatever it's called, the thing in Canada. Parasite, you know. Yeah, so, you know, we're, as far as I'm concerned, I want to see progress, I want to see it happening. I have okay, answers to so that, but... Um, yeah, we're going to take three, okay. three points. Okay. Very quick question. Mm -hmm. Fabulous, fabulous project, 100% convinced me as well. Um, uh, political risk um, across the various states of North Africa, not necessarily the, the strongest states. Is that reflected in yes. possibly your timing of interventions of the networks? Yes. That's my question. Yes. Thank you. Um, how is it? How does it compare to the cost of other renewables? Mm -hmm. um, why have you put the plants around the edge of the desert rather than in the middle where it's sunnier? Have you neglected the, the threat of terrorism attacking the cables? That's okay. Yes. yes um, we might have to come back <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. I, I have answers to that. So if you could if so, um, I can answer that later as well if the time runs out. So stay in the room if you like. So I always forgot the first question, just briefly. <laughs> Yeah, our implication. Yeah, we have first. Yeah, we have first power plants to be built. Morocco, for example, uh, power to to uh, UK and uh, Europe, as I said earlier. Uh, the time horizon for actually exporting the uh, electricity is to the end of the project. Uh, at the moment, we think about 2025, 2030, which is a big problem because we have a so-called electricity gap around almost now 2015 2020 because some power plants will be turned off and we will really have a gap and we don't know at the moment where it's coming from it's a large european problem uh, the problem we think it's coming from more bo uh, burning more oil and gas but um, power plants are built in uh, egypt we have the first one at the moment they're actually a combination of a gas power plant and a solar power plant uh, to see if the technology itself is feasible on large scale. <coughs> the, pro the projects in Morocco uh, are built first and they have the first solar, uh, the first only uh, thermal power plants. Why is that? For political reasons. Uh, as I said earlier, ho almost the whole economy is more or less controlled by the Moroccan king, a king who is very progressive compared to other countries. Uh, if I'm a king and I know I want to run a country for the next 200 years, I know how much oil I have left. At the moment, they generate electricity almost 80-90% from burning oil and gas within the country. Why should I do so? I can save the resources, wait, wait till the oil price go, goes up and sell them later. So it makes sense for the king to do it now. It's that, their way of thinking about it. Yeah? So they, and I personally, and that's the worst case scenario, I expect us as humans to use up every last drop before we start thinking doing something else and that's a very terrible thought why is that because our economy is based on oil we we have the the gas stations which we use so people think about what can we do we are used to that way we have to start thinking differently and that's where the problem is and this is why we focus on so electricity because electricity you can feed into a system which already exists uh, switching yeah. political risks, political risk, which also feeds to the terror, uh, terrorist uh, risk. Um, yes, a power plant is a possible risk in the desert, especially. You saw it uh, in the Arab Spring with the oil installations. Uh, terrorists can take over, but the difference is, whatever the terrorist wants, besides just destroying, if a new, go if they bring a new government and people in a country always want a new government, they don't really want terrorists. They want change. That's why the terrorists are there. A new government still needs to sell something. You have to export something. So sooner or later, they will go back and use the technology. A cable can be repaired. That's not a problem. What does the, do the French do? Well, you usually have a small military base next to, right, next to it. Germany doesn't have a foreign army, a foreign legion in a sense. So we're not thinking about it. Uh, but military is always thinking about this. The German military did a big study on peak oil and what all the possible implications is, are of that because there's a huge connection between uh, oil extraction and economy. It's almost always parallel. 
So if you reduce uh, oil production, you can almost assume that economy will go down and slow down. And if you go like have a decline of 20 percent, that's when a so-called mathematical bonification, I don't know how you call it in English. Yeah, you, you can't predict anymore. It sparks off. And um, thinking about, um, I come originally from banking, and if you think about the volatile uh, things about interest rate, negative interest rates, all the problems in that, uh, you can't even imagine what happens then. It's just uncontrollable. So we have to have a solution um, right now because it would take 20 years, according to science, to change from an uh, oil-based economy to a more electricity-based co uh, economy, especially that we need oil for medicine. Some medicine is based on oil. Plastic is made out of oil. Uh, it's not only that we need to burn oil to make electricity from it, we need it for other uh, uses, uh, and which is always ignored. And In what, terms what? of comparing, is it renewables? And the cost, yeah. Yeah, the cost of other renewables, that's a key thing, isn't it, really? Yeah, um, as I tried to say earlier, it all depends on uh, how you calculate it. The, fo the thing is, the sun comes to us for free. So over time, you don't have to burn anything. And the question is, how long uh, can a power plant made out of glass and steel exist? So if I have an amortization time of 100 years, it's the cheapest power available to you. Well, could even cheaper than, say, offshore wind? Or? Cheaper than everything. Right. Well, offshore wind, offshore wind, of course, has the same thing. Because uh, um, you work in that area, how much? Do you think 50 years, 100 years? Uh, well, it would be levelized cost for electricity. I think CSP is about, certainly about onshore wind at the moment. But at the moment, with definitely. The curves, it's, it's, what, I don't know, 15 euros per kilowatt hour. A good uh, optimistic estimate for concentrated solar power versus less for offshore, well, similar for offshore wind and so what less for onshore wind. Onshore wind is dead. No. Onshore wind is still exists. Problem there is you don't want it in your backyard. Okay, so should we take some more questions? Um, let's have some women. Yourself, lady in back, and at the end. Well, I was reading the other today that uh, the British uh, Energy Secretary was going to Iceland to talk about a possible link. Now, they've got a lot of uh, geothermal yes. in Iceland. It, which wasn't on your map, actually. It was. The, 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 the cable was there as a dotted line. I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, maybe it's cut so, off. Yeah. And there is a, a link being discussed with Norway as well. And there is one with the Netherlands. Yes. So would it be possible to exchange energy between those countries to begin with? Yes. Uh, it will be, especially because we think uh, about uh, using uh, Northern Europe's water resources as a way to store electricity. Uh, because uh, the thing I didn't have tapped in, electricity has a price, and nowadays it's exchanged as a, almost like a stock exchange for electricity. And we had in Germany that, like a Black Friday. Nobody wanted to buy electricity. It was available, but the price was so high that nobody wanted to buy it. And finally, we had to use the national reserves. Nobody talks about it. But people hesitated buying it. And the problem with wind power is you have to use it right away. Electricity generated from PV and wind power is you cannot really store it. It is produced, and you have to use it. It's a great source of energy, but you have to use it right away. So if nobody buys it on an exchange, you have a problem. So. Connecting different countries me allows us to ship the electricity over to that country when it's needed and when it's produced. Okay, let's take these two points back to back. So. I just wanted to play the advocate of PV a little bit because I was surprised. I know you started off with, with CSP and uh, there's good reasons for CSP, but then talking about investment risks, about the actual needs of the population in the Euro region, PV can provide the answer and also it's a shorter time horizon in which you can install. PV, so, and I know that actually there's a tech industry, right, the industrial yes. they are working with PV, so I'm surprised that actually you as a foundation are still, like, um, um. so much focused on no, no, just unfortunately, it's due to the time horizon. Uh, PV is a big chunk, especially for off-grid installation. Thinking about uh, sub-Saharan Africa, where you don't have a grid available to you, uh, it's a great way. 
Um, also, you have to think uh, the prices for PV panels drop dramatically. Um, unfortunately, that's where we, s we are a little bit critical about it. And the cells are nowadays produced mostly in China. And unfortunately, some of them produce in a very dirty way. So as a foundation, coming from a scientific background, we want to say, okay, we are fine with that as long as certain standards are met, which are hardly to enforce in a country like China. We're working on that as well, uh, but it's a bit a problematic thing. Otherwise, PV is a great, a great way as well. Problem there is using also rare earths. Um, every technology has its limits. And some people always promote nuclear energy as a green energy and saying it can replace everything. Problem there is if you just, if you just produce, or if you all produce all electricity from nuclear power, the resources of uranium and plutonium only last for 10 years. So it's just the same thing as oil. Funny Unless enough. you breed. Sorry? Unless you breed. You've still got the security issues with, with breeding. You can do you, 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 yeah. 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 you can extend yeah. that, but... Um, Uh, we also look at the topic, especially as German uh, media always thinks we build a power plant which has exactly that dimension as a red square, and we build it exactly in that position. Uh, we get a lot of letters saying, but there is a tribe, um, and we research that uh, we build, it's like many, many uh, power plants, not only one. And the uh, good, uh, the exa, no, the big advantage of the desert is, um, Yes, you have tribes moving through a certain, um, to that space, but um, compared to other spaces, there's hardly anything in the desert. So the risk of uh, affecting wildlife uh, is low, almost to zero, especially because we plan power plants in a way where you can remove, if you want, you can remove them by 100% and you just leave a even space. Um, Another problem, as I said earlier, is water. If you use water resources, and you have to be think about bringing them there, because if there would be like an oasis, but that's used uh, by caravans or anything, you have to be aware of the fact that other people need that water. You cannot tap into resource which takes away from somebody else. Uh, so yes, that is research. Always more room for more research, actually. Yes? I'll let you handle that. So, and here, and at the back. <coughs> you haven't mentioned hydrogen uh, as a means of storage and of transportation. Get to possibilities. Is it, is it, is it an answer? You can use three questions. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, we've got a question on hydrogen. Hydrogen, okay. okay. Um, it's asking about tidal energy and weight power. I don't think that was really mentioned, but particularly with tidal power, there'd be a lot going for it, actually in the UK as well. The other thing is, you did say it's easier when you've got a king, but it seems to me... <laughs> it was an example in a sense. Yeah, yeah, but it's, it's come up in other discussions as well about, about China, but because there's no real democracy, quick to get some big projects done. It seems to be the issue should be much bigger about how you popularise the ideas and get democratic popular consent. for uh, hydrogen first. Um, yes, we think about hydrogen. Uh, unfortunately, many, many topics in science always follow like almost an economy. You have a wave of interest and then it slows down and then a wave of interest again. It's still 
researched and you see projects in Germany where you put uh, hydrogen in buses in a public uh, transportation for example and but we think the loss of uh, you have by putting it into a tank and shipping the hydrogen over to the other side uh, is greater than actually putting it into a DC cable. Another thing it has that political implication we talked about. If you have a cable, you bind both countries together. And um, the advantage we see is hydrogen somehow feeds into the same way of thinking as the oil did. It fits more to our way of thinking because you can put it into a tank as a liquid. And, and as humans, we are somehow to use ways we are, uh, we are used to. Like putting a liquid into a tank is somehow more appealing, yes? This is a serious comment that might be a bit flip. You, you in Germany have been blessed with seals, but we've been lumbered with being, being shell. Putting, putting the hydrogen into tanks mm. and pipelines maps into their technology and probably their management can get their heads around that. Because what was interesting for people that, 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 that are buying into your project, there wasn't one. British name down there that I recognised. And Nuto no. is actually a British one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, 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 distributed storage systems of hydrogen that can be switched on as a way with no. the drive so. I, I agree to that. It would be a way to store uh, electricity and it makes absolutely sense and it's appealing to the existing industry mm -hmm. uh, because it uses more or, say, more or less the, the base of transportation, uh, the base of storing it, the base of delivering they're used to. So from that point of view it has a lot of charm uh, but as all other implications I unfortunately do we can talk about later people. Yeah, go um, tidal power and democratic yes, inefficiency. Tidal power plays a big role, for example, uh, in Desert Tech UK concept, and there's something called actually Sea Tech, which looks at that idea, uh, which is a, I don't know, maybe a spark of, but they work close together with that. Um, the, tech the technology has a lot of potential, from what um, scientists tell me. I'm not an expert in that, and there's a new, I saw just a new concept for a new uh, tidal power concept, which seems to be very uh, feasible to me. But um, let me put it this way, the, the research on the desert tech is like five years ahead of that. I, I, see, I see totally coming, uh, especially because we want a mix of energies. And that brings also the democratic perspective into it. Uh, bringing more different sources of energy into the game reduces uh, the risk of total monopolism. We are, as a desert tech, focusing on the larger installations. Because from a German perspective or a country's perspective, you have to feed your industry at a point. Um, so you have to look at larger projects. While the PV panels, for example, uh, we use in Germany as a very de democratic way to uh, electrify the country. Because everybody can put the PV panel uh, on their rooftop. You probably don't have enough space for a plant like that. So it's somehow bringing all the concepts and all the different ways into the boat and um, com uh, connecting them. And this is where we think the democratic aspect also comes from. <coughs> Talking about democracy uh, in the Arabic Spring, it's difficult. Um, I have discussed the topic about Libya many times and with many scientists and uh, also um, involved in that region. And, how stable Lib Lib Libya is, Liberia is, nobody knows. We expect it to split apart in two countries, maybe even three countries. Difficult. It's difficult. The only thing is what happens if you look at the real case scenario. When you have people from a country actually working on the side, you find that they are the ones that are protecting that power plant because it's their job. And they know times will change. If you only have foreigners working in that plant, there's of course nobody, beside the French army, army base maybe built right next to it, protecting a plant. If you connect with local people and make the power plant their own in a sense, they will be the one 
protecting it. And a new government will have the same interest, if they're not totally fanatic, uh, selling something, exporting something, having something to give to your own people. If you cannot give your people the necessary resources to survive, they will start the next revolution if you don't kill them. And so these things are connected. And this is where democracy comes from. Another thing is we in Europe maybe have a different understanding of democracy than people in Libya, for example, have. I think in a way, and it's my personal opinion, I have to say, if you have uh, a parliament here, it's, it cannot be pro reproduced in a country like that. But you have maybe a group of older people sitting together making decisions, which is almost like a parliament in a sense. Because they are the power holder, they are oldest families, they are based on families as large family. It's not comparable. So in Germany, we always discuss that yeah, we have to democrat, uh, bring democracy, democracy down there. It will not definitely not, not look like a German parliament. Yeah. And that's the effect I think we have to wear the way of. On to energy sovereignty. Would you read? Sorry? Sorry. Could you, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the term sovereign? Sovereignty, ownership. Uh, uh, oh, oh yeah, that's the thing. Um, the question always is who owns the grid? Who owns the power plants? And from a German perspective, when we talk about the 400 billion, that's why I don't like to use that number because it always con causes confusion. Um, does the German government have to hand over us 400 billion? No, in a, in a sense, it's still the industry building a power plant. Uh, as a Desert Tech Foundation, we think about community-funded power plants, uh, but it's something in a five to ten year term. And I'm not, I think I'm not even allowed to talk about that one. Right? Okay. <laughs> but uh, yes, there is ideas to bring um, that into the game as well. Thinking about the Moroccan king, yes, we have to fall in suit into a certain, to a certain degree into what's there. We cannot change the whole country. And um, thinking about the king, I think he is quite progressive within the northern African setting. Whatever, it's my personal perspective. I have to say. Right, we have uh, one more, seven minutes left, probably more like five. So we can afford to take a couple more questions, preferably from people who haven't actually had a, a, an opportunity to ask anything yet. So there's gentlemen here, um, here, and perhaps. Okay, I, I understand you come here as an applicant, I follow you, and great. But all the same, if you could slip into the assessment mode and talk a little bit more about Germany and about such people as the late Cameron Chair, a mm -hmm. uh, parliamentarian, a very great reputation, pushed um, solar energy very much. His voice and many others have been and still are against desert yes. What is their reasoning? Please be honest and tell us. Yeah. Let's and take all the questions first okay. of us. Okay. I have a question of uh, accelerating the Southern European part of the project with a view of stabilizing Europe uh, and possibly also uh, getting sense of the German decision to uh, phase out nuclear. I don't quite see that coming up. Wind power has, without the cigarette, uh, some obvious weaknesses. Yes. Okay, well, this is a little bit more of what universal perspective is. It's all about how much more energy you can squeeze out of this planet than its land mass, but not even a, how little or how much we can reduce the energy usage. It's, it's never come up here, and this seems to be a bit of an expansionist paradigm, not a homeostatic one. And we also have to look into the total carrying capacity of the planet, and I would put it bluntly, this is a predatory thinking, because you've got an asset, i.e. the electrical energy you're generating in, in Africa, so that you can sell that, so it's an economical issue, if you've got vested interest, interest to have this going, but should we look into how much we can reduce our collective uh, consumption rather than expansion, more, how much more we can squeeze out of this planet? We need to rethink that option, that's my issue. And I'm going to leave. Is it right if I do it for that one? Yeah, yeah. Perhaps to make sure that everyone uh, 
has no response and we just yeah, 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 Oh, uh, Hammond Shear, yeah. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, he cannot be with us anymore. Um, to maybe just for the people who don't know him, uh, he is a German parliamentary and uh, he focused uh, very much on PV. And it's about the idea of democratizing uh, energy produ uh, production. Uh, he was largely against monopolistic ideas, which I totally understand. Um, he always described the desert tech as something um, built into the desert and nobody knows what happens. Uh, unfortunately, he cannot argue anymore for us because he died uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, I met him at one point, he's a great person, and, um, but like everybody, everybody has personal ideas and opinion about certain things and how things could be or should, should be. Um, I don't know what his motivation directly came from. I cannot comment on that. Um, but the ideas have evolved on both ends. In Germany, we largely install PV panels and we continue to do so. Why is that? Because we uh, have politics deciding on certain feet and tariffs, um, allowing people to get kind of a small to big profit from it. So. It's a thing um, how politics and industry connects. And uh, we wanted that, and we uh, have a house where I have PV panels as well. So yes, it's a great idea. And uh, we will continue to do it, but it slows down at the moment. It's a bit, uh, it's hard to say. Um, it's an individual decision to say, okay, I want a PV panel on the roof or not. But Politically, do the Greens in Germany have an opinion now and yours has failed in the past five years. You know, the inheritance of the Hermann Shear legacy. Do they have a view of this? Uh, I haven't heard. But um, I hope um, we can bring all everybody uh, on board. On the, on the point, everybody will have a different opinion if they have their own way of thinking, which is great because nobody, the desert tech concept is not perfect. And uh, I always like to hear new ideas, new concepts and uh, what we and the scientists involved do then is try to get hold of that idea and see how it can feed in, um, um, which also brings to the question of the carrying capacity uh, I try to explain. Yes, in Germany we also focus on reducing energy consumption by putting isolation on our houses and reducing um, that. Um, if we can reduce energy consumption, it goes, goes a large way. But uh, I think due to population increase and the per capita increase in countries like India uh, and China, as well as especially as Africa, we will see, still see an increase in consumption overall. And uh, thinking about the desert as a source or asset, well, okay, I come from banking, so I'm familiar with these terms, but it's more about there's an energy that's available to us. Uh, we have a certain amount of people living on that planet and we're not thinking about, uh, we, the, they will still be there. So we have to somehow feed their needs. Yeah. If you don't think about uh, going back to having less people living on Earth, uh, you have to do something about the living the people here. So we will consume some kind of energy. And I think there's a large energy efficiency factors built into all this consumption. Yes. Forty percent in Europe, I don't know what the mean figure is, but mm -hmm. it, it, in terms of overall electricity it's not expansion, it's it's kind of reduced but to yeah. switch fossil fuels to renewables. That's I had I had eighteen percent reduction on it. Eighteen percent it's it's due to shipping industry from here to China. That's how the European Commission is able to fulfill their figures. And on top of it, uh, in Germany, like isolating how a lot of energy <coughs> is actually lost uh, by heat uh, in the winter. Uh, because your, our windows and our houses are not isolated properly. Unfortunately, having my house, the house I'm living in isolated myself, if it's not done properly, it doesn't help a lot. So I have an insulation on the outside now and I don't feel any much of a difference. Okay, we're gonna have to. But I forgot a question. I think. There. Ah, yes. Uh, Southern Europe. Yeah, that brings us to the question of uh, Greece, for example. 
uh, and especially in Germany, there was an idea of um, reducing debt by exporting solar energy. Unfortunately, most sites in Egypt are not suitable due to the land surface. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, Greece. Greece, yeah. Or did I misunderstood the question? You just mentioned Egypt. Oh, did I say Egypt? I wanted to say Greece. Oh my gosh, sorry. Um, no, Egypt. Uh, unfortunately, uh, many sites in Egypt, uh, trees are not suitable due to uh, the surface and a lot of clouds. There is a great location which is called Crater. Uh, that's a suitable place, but it involves a sea cable. Uh, another problem is we would have to build new cables. I mean, these research that uh, there is some cables going through former Yugoslavia and one cable, as far as I know, going to Italy, uh, but they are not uh, big enough uh, for uh, at the moment. At the moment, electricity goes to Egypt and <laughs> Greece. <laughs> I, uh, we could send it back in a sense. So there is ideas going on because uh, Greece needs one thing the most that's actually investment. Um, what about wind and waste? Uh, I have no figures on wind and waste. It's only a chart, I don't think it's much of a Okay, so if we could. Um, Give our speakers a round of applause. And for those of you that still have questions and advice, just form them up to give you.